Uh, that was a very good uh, introduction for me. Um, as I said, I'll be talking, uh, I'm the oddball here, so that's why I'm the last speaker, I guess. So um, I'll be talking totally different from the bench side. It'll be, uh, all will be applicable to human beings. So I'll be talking a little bit about liver fibrosis. Everybody knows about it, so I'll just uh, probably rapidly go through them and talk about conventional imaging methods to, for detecting fibrosis in humans as well as newer techniques, but my focus of the talk would be on magnetic resonance elastography. So as you all know, the liver fibrosis is the common final pathway for all chronic liver diseases. Normal liver usually has less than 1% collagen by weight, but in, uh, in cases of cirrhosis and advanced fibrosis, it can go as high as 30 milligrams per gram weight of the liver. So there's, an expo there's a big increase in the amount of the fibrotic tissues in a normal liver, from normal liver to a cirrhotic liver. And we also know that the liver fibrosis is dynamic. There is deposition of collagen as well as removal of uh, collagen by enzymes by activated by the stellar cells and other cells. And they always maintain a balance. But when this balance goes disordered, there will be a progressive fibrosis. And that's when we come into picture to detect the fibrosis. We also know that the collagen content in the liver is not a very systematic increase. It is initially a very small increase as we go through the stages, and suddenly it goes into an exponential increase in the collagen content. Now, this is maybe attributed to the liver recovery. The liver in the early stages of fibrosis recovers very well, whereas once it reaches its stage where there's no recovery or known as decompensation, then there is an exponential increase in the fibrosis. Now what does this mean to us? It means that the early changes are difficult to detect, whereas the later changes are very easy to detect. So staging of the liver fibrosis is important because it's also useful to res uh, predict the response to the treatment. That is, uh, the stage two liver fibrosis is usually an indication for antifibrotic treatment, whereas the stage four fibrosis or cirrhosis is usually an indication for surveillance of complications. It is also useful to define follow-up goals like mild fibrosis to assess treatment response as well as progression of fibrosis. And as I mentioned earlier, cirrhosis we always do for surveillance of hepatocellular carcinoma as well as complications such as portal hypertension and breeding viruses. Liver biopsy, as Matt mentioned already, it has a lot of disadvantage. Nobody wants to go through the, uh, this procedure because it, most of the time it is because of pain following the uh, biopsy. But it has its own advantages because it gives you information about inflammation as well as a very sensitive technique to detect early fibrosis. But the most important advantage of liver biopsy is you can make an etiological diagnosis as what's the cause for the chronic liver disease. Serological markers, as Matt again alluded to, is not reliable. It is moderately sensitive and specific, but combination of markers has been found to be useful in advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis. So naturally, imaging techniques were put into forefront to come up with a non-invasive technique to detect fibrosis. I'll be briefly mentioning about the conventional imaging techniques such as the ultrasound, computer tomography, and magnetic resonance imaging, as well as about the newer advanced technique. And of course, I'll be talking mostly about MR elastography. Now, what we do in conventional imaging is try to imagine, uh, try to image the liver and try to see the gross changes which occurs what you see in a specimen of uh, cirrhotic liver. That is coarse texture, heterogeneity, nodular surface, multiple regenerative nodules, dysplastic nodules, as well as some volumetric changes, such as usually right lobe is bigger than the left lobe, but in a case of cirrhosis, the left lobe becomes bigger. As in chronic viral hepatitis, the right lobe is the one which undergoes atrophy. Now we try to see these changes on ultrasound. And ultrasound is a very good technique for detection of advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis, but not a very good technique to detect early fibrosis. Now, this is an example of an early fibrosis, but if you pass it to many ultrasonologists or the radi radiologists, nearly 80% of them will classify that as normal. But it is actually a mild fibrosis, a biopsy-proven fibrosis. So what I'm trying to mention, uh, suggest over here is that ultrasound is not very sensitive to pick up early fibrosis, but a very good technique to demonstrate the changes on advanced and cirrhotic liver. Similar, the CT and MRI, we all again look for this nodular surface, heterogeneous texture, as well as volumetric changes. Again, these two techniques are, again, sensitive for advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis, but not in early fibrosis. So if you look at the summary slide over here, if, you, if you're looking at the early changes, that is hepatocyte injury and inflammation and early fibrosis, 
The conventional imaging techniques have very low sensitivity, but when it comes to complication and cirrhosis, they have excellent uh, sensitivity to detect these changes. So conventional imaging is very useful to detect complications as well as advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis, but not very useful for early fibrosis. We have come up with newer techniques with the MRI, but most of these have uh, fizzled out because they are either, they, such as the dual contrast enhanced MRI, where we use iron oxide particles, is no longer available because the FDA uh, did not clear it anyway for use. MR spectroscopy is still investigational. In humans, I'm talking about live uh, uh, in vivo M MR spectroscopy, as well as MR perfusion. These are technically very demanding in a cl busy clinical practice. We came up with another technique called as the diffusion weighted imaging, or the DWI. It's a very sensitive technique. Now, what we understand by the DWI is that it's the, in cases of liver fibrosis, there is restricted diffusion. So, uh, uh, what we, we use a term called apparent diffusion coefficient, which, uh, uh, which actually quantifies the amount of restricted diffusion. And this ADC of cirrhotic liver is supposed to be less than the normal liver. And it has been shown that this technique is, can predict moderate and severe fibrosis with high accuracy. But there are studies which have shown that it is not able to discriminate between low and high grade fibrosis as well. So overall, even though the DOWI is a sensitive technique, it is not a very good accurate technique to distinguish between different stages of fibrosis, especially uh, the mild stages of fibrosis. <coughs> So we come up to this new techniques called as the elastographic techniques, and this can be either ultrasound based or MRI based. Now why we, what is the meaning of magnetic resonance elastography? The first two words stands for the MRI technique, and the last word elastography means that it's the method for direct imaging of mechanical properties of tissues. And it provides what we know as quantifiable par parameters, the mechanical properties of tissues, we label, we call them differently by different people. The pure scientists will like to call it elasticity. We use the term stiffness because we cannot differentiate st elasticity from viscosity. And for clinical terms, we use the word hardness and softness of tissues. So stiffness is the most preferred term because it includes both the viscosity and the elasticity of the tissues. And we all know baby skin is very soft, but as we age, our skin loses its elasticity. And also we know that in some cases, the wrinkled skin is beautiful. But at the same time, we also know that when we have having stiff tissue, it means something is going wrong with you. And we need sometimes massage to relieve ourselves. So this concept of tissue stiffness, <laughs> the concept of tissue stiffness is very well known. And everybody knows that when things go wrong, things become harder in our bodies or stiffer. And it is very well applied in clinical things as well. We use, pul we use palpate pulse. That's elasticity again. We also look for nodules in, your, in the neck for lymph nodes. We also palpate organomegaly, such as shown over here, the spleen, by means of palpation. So all this palpation is actually what we are looking for is elasticity or the stiffness of the tissue. And we also tell patients to examine themselves, especially females, breast self-examination to look for hard lumps. So elasticity concept is very well known, but we have not used it very much into imaging. And we also know that we can detect stiff thyroid nodules for thyroid cancers, as well as organomegalies in cases of liver. But liver is situated under the rib cage, so you will not be always be able to palpate the whole of liver. So that's the reason why the elastography techniques were developed to measure the elasticity of liver. Why do we need to know that? Normal liver is usually soft, but as the fibrosis goes and cirrhosis becomes, the liver becomes hard. So it makes sense to detect the stiffness of the tissue or quantify the tissue stiffness in order to differentiate normal versus fibrotic or cirrhotic liver. We also know that the spectrum of stiffness of the tissues is very, very wide. If we look at here, the liver is almost 10 to the power of one grade, whereas that of the cartilage and the epididymis is about 10 to the power of eight. So there's almost like eight grades or eight uh, times the stiffness chain, uh, differences are there. So it means that we can differentiate different tissues depending on the stiffness. And we compare that to the CT scan and the MRI, the differences between the tissues with the measured quantitative parameters are very low. So stiffness or the elastography techniques is more promising to differentiate between different organs and different tissues. Coming to MRI elastography, now what does MRI elastography do? MRI elastography, this is an example of a conventional MR imaging. It is actually a, it is a cirrhotic liver. 
but it may not be able to say that by one slice itself. What MOI elastography does is it gives us the stiffness map. Now this stiffness map shows this color change corresponding to that of the liver. It also provides us what is known as the stiffness scale, or the shear stiffness scale, which ranges from zero to 10 kilopascals. Purple and blue, that is up to two kilopascals, is good. You can see the soft tissues here, and in the subcutaneous fat, they are soft. Normally, the normal liver will also look blue or purple, or zero to 2.5 kilopascal. But this patient has cirrhotic liver, and you can see that the stiffness of this tissue, of this liver, is very high, almost up to eight kilopascals. So in MR elastography, we measure the tissue stiffness in kilopascals. Now let us see how we do this MR elastography. This is a conventional MR image. What we do is that we place a passive driver. Now this passive driver sends in sound waves at 60 hertz. And this sound waves goes through the liver, and it produces shear waves, and this shear wave is imaged using this MRE sequence, and these are actually the shear waves which are going through the liver in this normal patient, in this normal subject. And after the shear waves are uh, imaged by what is called as the wave image, there's a complex inversion algorithm which converts the shear waves information into what is known as a stiffness map. And you can put a region of interest over the liver and measure the stiffness of the liver. So what it measure, actually measures is the speed of sound going through the tissue. And this gives you the measurement of uh, stiffness. As we all know, like if you put a, make a clap on your hand, it is very soft, but you hit on a board, it is, makes a loud sound and travels very fast. So the stiffer the tissue, the faster the sound wave goes, and this is reflected as longer wavelength within the tissue. Now let us look how we do it clinically. Uh, hopefully this video will run. So this is the a setup showing an MR scanner. And here is where the passive driver is, and this is applied over the liver. And this sends in these acoustic waves through the liver. And not only just one slice, it is all three-dimensional all around the liver. Now let us consider one single slice through the liver in a normal patient or a normal liver. Now when the shear waves goes, this is what happens to the tissue. The shear waves goes through the normal tissue. And put it as exaggerated because it does not occur at that level. It occurs at micron levels. Okay? And this is a hard tissue or the cirrhotic liver. You can see that the liver is quite stiff, but the waves are longer. Now, if you image these shear waves going through this liver with MR elastography, this is what we will see. We'll see a smaller waves through the normal liver and longer waves through this cirrhotic liver. And this can be converted using inversion algorithm to give what is known as a stiffness map, a normal liver, which is blue and purple, and a stiff liver or the cirrhotic liver, which is almost red in color. So this is the basic principle and the setup for MR elastography. So again, I'm showing you the difference between a normal liver and a fibrotic liver. And the normal liver's stiffness is about 2.3 kilopascals, and we use 2.5 as a cutoff for a normal liver. And this is a cirrhotic liver with 8.2 kilopascals. Not only you can differentiate between a normal and the cirrhotic liver, we can also look at different stages. Now, as the stage of the fibrosis increases, you can see that the color of the liver, or the stiffness map, changes. So from blue-purple, it is becoming blue-green, green to yellow, and almost red in color. And when you compare it with the normal, you can see the difference between these. And the measurements are also different from 2.1 to 3.1. And as it goes, and goes, it can go even up to 20 kilopascals, depending on how hard the liver is. And we have done this in many studies, and we have shown this incremental change and it is very useful for differentiating or staging these liver fibrosis. It has been shown in even in uh, hepatitis B patients as a pure group, and it has been shown to be very accurate in differentiating different stages of fibrosis. It is a very highly reproducible test. There are several uh, studies which have been performed to show the reproducibility of MRE, and the reproducibility, the variation is less than 15% or even less than 10%. Even it can be tested and retested. This is just to show that the MRE is a robust technique, and it can be. It has a very high uh, intraclass coefficient of 0 0.93 to 0 0.94. It also correlates with the collagen content. This is a study which we, which I did in my previous uh, institute, where in which we showed that the amount of collagen by, measured by fibro C index actually correlated with the stiffness of the tissue. But notice that there is a different. There's a wide range 
in the higher stiffness values. That is because cirrhotic livers are very heterogeneous. The, stiff, the amount of fibrotic contents are very heterogeneous, but still a very good uh, correlation between the stiffness and the collagen content. Let me talk about a little bit about why we want to do MRE and why it is advantageous to do the MRE. Now, it can be done even in difficult situations like very obese patient. We, can, we have even done it with MRE in patients who are as long as they fit into the MR scanner. I should mention that. As long as they fit into the MR scanner, we can do the MRE in these patients. And we have done a patient with 48 BMI, and this is the example which I'm showing over here is only 36. We can even do when there is fluid in the stomach, in the abdomen. So the fluid does not impede the transmission of the shear waves into the liver, and we can get very good uh, results in these patients. And MRE can detect fibrosis even when conventional imaging is normal. Now, if you look at these two, uh, uh, examples over here. This is a patient with NASH and this is with primary biliary cirrhosis. These will be considered as normal appearing liver, but both of them had increased stiffness and biopsy confirmed stage two and stage one fibrosis. And this is something which I'm interested in. I think that the pattern of stiffness distribution may actually suggest an underlying pathology. Look at a particular example of this primary sclerosing cholangitis where in this, this peripheral stiffness distribution, which is very typical in primary sclerosing cholangitis, where in which we see the changes in the periphery occurring first. And compare that with the autoimmune hepatitis, where there is regenerative nodules surrounded by stiffness, uh, stiff regions or fibrotic regions. So this needs to be studied further, and we may be able to tell by the stiffness map what kind of etiology is underlying. The most important advantage of MRE is that the fatty change in the liver does not affect the stiffness. So everybody asked the question, does it affect the stiffness? But we have done make several studies, and we have shown that fatty change in the liver does not affect the measured liver stiffness with MI elastography. And in fact, this is very useful for us because we can differentiate simple steatosis, that is just a fatty liver, to that of the steatohepatitis and steatohepatitis with fibrosis. Here's an example of a patient who has only simple steatosis. Liver stiffness is only 1.6 kilopascals. As compared to that with the steatohepatitis with F2 fibrosis, which goes up to 4.2, as well as up to, uh, in the case of cirrhosis, it's even higher. And here's an, another example to show how it is useful clinically. Now, if you look at these patients, the estimated fat fraction in these fatty liver patients is about 8%, 26%, and 34%. And these are the ultrasound images. Now, looking at these images, which one would you think will have cirrhosis? Or which one would you think will have fibrosis? Now, if you're looking, if you're, you're routinely doing an ultrasound, this looks very coarse liver compared to this fine liver. And this is somewhat intermediate. So this, you would think, probably is a chronic liver disease, maybe having uh, uh, fibrosis. But fatty change is also known to cause fibrosis, uh, this kind of heterogeneous appearance, especially this patient has 34% fat. Now, when we did the MRE in these patients, it revealed the opposite. Actually, the patient which looked like normal liver had the highest stiffness and, in fact, biopsy-proven steatohepatitis. And the one with had coarse liver just had fatty liver with only 2.7 kilopascals. So what we're trying to say here is that you, we may be able to see or uh, detect early fibrosis in those patients where in which every other test may be normal. You might be able to detect subtle changes. And this, uh, in fact, differentiating steatohepatitis from simple steatosis has a very high accuracy. And in fact, it is very useful for detection of advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis. We also have, uh, since we introduced this in 2007 at the Mayo Clinic, we have been coming up with more and more clinical applications of this, not only just detecting fibrosis, we also use it for other clinical purposes. One of them is for longitudinal follow-up. Now, this patient underwent uh, MR elastography on consecutive years with primary biliary cirrhosis. At the initial time, 2010 had stiffness of only 2.8 kilopascals, but in 2012 had 3.4 kilopascals. Now, note, if you notice these images, there's hardly any change in the appearance of the liver, but there is increase in the stiffness of the liver, showing that there is early fibrosis is developing. You can also see, uh, we can also use the MRE for assessment of treatment response. Here's a patient with chronic hepatitis C. In 2009, stiffness was 4.2 kilopascals, and three years later, after treatment, the stiffness reduced to 2.8 kilopascals. So we can actually show, demonstrate these changes in the stiffness, and it probably corresponds to the dec decrease in the fibrosis. But this patient is unfortunate. 2009 had a stiffness of 4.1 kilopascals. 
failed to respond to PEG interferon therapy as well as, I forget the other one, and another uh, agent, and showed rapid progression of fibrosis. From 4.1 within three years' time became 8.5 kilopascal. And these are the patients who tip over to become decompensated cirrhosis and end up in complications. <coughs> And we are also learning over the time that the liver stiffness is also not just static, it is also dynamic. And most of you have had, just had food, and I believe all of you have normal livers. So when you have a normal liver, when you eat food about 30 minutes time after you're eating food, especially high sugar content, fructose content food, it increases blood flow to the liver. And in a normal liver, this does not cause any change in stiffness. Whereas in a fibrotic liver, it cannot accommodate the increased blood flow, so the stiffness increases. So here's an example of a healthy volunteer after uh, getting a uh, meal uh, uh, challenge. There's no difference in the stiffness after the meal. You can see that the stomach is empty here and the stomach is full. And whereas a cirrhosis patient, you can see that from 8.5 kilopascal, his stiffness increased to 12.7. So there is not only just a static component or the structural component for the stiffness, there's also a vascular component, especially this becomes active in fibrotic livers because they are not able to accommodate the increase in flow. We also found that the MRE of the spleen or the stiffness of the spleen is able to predict the viruses in chronic liver diseases. So if you have a stiffness more than 10 kilopascals, we can actually predict the bleeding viruses by 100% accuracy. And we are able to do not just a 2D uh, uh, elastography, we can also do 3D. And this might actually give you a picture of fibrosis burden overall in the liver. The whole liver can be scanned with 32 slices, and this will take about two minutes of scanning. And we also be able to predict the decompensation in this patient when you use the baseline. And, and this is a study we just published in uh, hepatology. Uh, General of Hepatology this year, we showed that the baseline liver stiffness of more than 5.8 kilopascal is independently associated with decompensate liver disease over a time period, especially after three years. So you can show that how much, is, uh, how much of liver has been affected and whether it has been beyond the repair uh, capacity of the liver. This is another interesting one which I used, uh, did it as a fellow over in Mayo Clinic. Uh, detection of whether uh, there are any significant differences between <coughs> stiffness of malignant and benign tumors. We actually showed that the malignant liver masses are significantly stiffer than benign liver masses. And this was actually using a cutoff of five kilopascals. All the malignant tumors could be separated from the benign tumors except for two uh, hemangiomas because uh, those hemangiomas were actually were very fibrotic. So these were called as sclerosed hemangiomas. And those are the ones which could give you a false positive, but there was no false negative. Um, MRE is not a perfect technique. It has its own limitations. If you, it's a breath hold technique. So if the patient is not able to hold breath even for 12 seconds, it will fail. And now you can see this patient could not hold breath for 12 seconds. So that's when the MRE can fail. And um, as I showed earlier, the stiffness can also be attributed to acute inflammation. If you have acute hepatitis, Acute inflammation of the liver or acute alcoholic binge, don't do MRE because it will give you high stiffness because liver is inflamed. So we always suggest that don't do MRE when the liver is inflamed. Do it the MRE when the, all the inflammation has settled down. And in, MRE can be affected with iron overload, but we have come up with a solution for that. We have devised new sequences where in which you can work with the patients even with liver iron overload. So MRE experience has been growing, and more than 300 centers worldwide have now have the capability to perform MRE. And uh, at Mayo Clinic, we have scanned more than 4,500 patients now since we have introduced it. And several studies have uh, confirmed its accuracy in staging as well as detection of fibrosis. And you can see that the accuracies are very high in the 90s, uh, even more than 0.95. And it has been shown that the MRE is much more accurate than the ultrasound-based technique over here. And MRE lies way ahead of the ultrasound-based uh, fibro scan or the transient elastography. It is also much better than the serum enzyme test. You can see that the big gap between the serum enzyme test diagnostic capability versus that of the MRE. And the most important one which I want to highlight is that liver biopsy samples only one fifty thousandth of the liver. Fibro scan will uh, sample only one five hundredth of a liver. With MRE, we can potentially scan the whole liver. So the sample, sampling errors is minimized with um, MRE. So I propose that um, MRE would be the biomarker for the liver fibrosis because as a technique it is non-invasive, does not involve radiation, does, uh, assesses large volume of liver, 
it's accurate, reproducible, repeatable, and a high observer, inter-observer agreement. Actually, and also correlates with the fibrotic content and can detect minor changes in fibrotic burden. And it's a versatile technique, it's BMI independent, and it is useful in most chronic liver diseases, as well as useful for clinical and uh, uh, drug trials. And there are some limitations, which is being the general contraindications for an MRI study and a severely iron overloaded liver. So in summary, I would say that it is a potential biomarker for liver fibrosis, and it may also be useful for follow-up and uh, progression and regression of liver fibrosis and assessment of therapeutic response. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Richard Eamon. Uh, he's the inventor of the MR elastography technique as well as my mentor, and I have borrowed some slides from him for this presentation. Thank you. Yes. Just a simple question. I would say what we do at the Mayo Clinic, at the Mayo Clinic we don't charge for this. What we do is that we integrate with this with an MRI liver study and we treat it as a sequence. So we don't charge for MRI as such. I'm not in a position to comment on that. <laughs> yes, please. Um, what, what do you mean by group analysis? So, not a single subject, but the whole Yeah, uh, we have actually recently done a meta-analysis where in which we have individual, taken individual patient data from 12 different studies, and we have shown that it is still accurate, and we have uh, tried to overcome the multiple sampling errors. So the bootstrapping technique was used for that, and we did show that even uh, despite using uh, multiple iterations, it's stable, it's quite stable. Yes, please. I'm just curious, in your pseudo-colored images, the bones you show, the ribs and the spinal column, is that because you, is there a softer scale? Yeah, it's a softer. Bones are really stiff, so they won't come up. So what it does is when you keep the scale 0 to 8, either the, the inversion algorithm either gives it blue or at red because they are the extreme. So they're always shown as red, yeah. But if I use a scale like a 0 to 1,000 kilopascals, mm -hmm. then probably they'll show up. Yes, please. So our is MRI, is it correlated with uh, traditional serum markers of fibrosis? Yeah. It is. Um, I would say a serum enzyme test, but not serum markers, like a, a hyaluronidase or other <laughs> tests, direct serum, serum direct markers. But with the liver enzyme test, yes. And if you combine those two, what's your combined liquid accuracy? I don't think we need to combine because MRI by itself is 0 0.98. I mean, s several studies have shown, tried to show an increment, but there's no point in showing an increment when it is, the test is already so good. What do you think the possibility, given the prevalence of the disease, that this could become a screening? I think there is a very good possibility. That's why probably I'm here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, to get, yeah, we have to wrap up. He's got a cab that's ready to, to take him.